title of the show, Aloha from Hawaii. Kick up on the album. joining us today. Welcome to Update Fridays. I'm CJ Holmes, founder of Homeowners for Justice and your host for bringing you the latest and greatest news from the foreclosure battlefront. I want to start today. I, I really believe everybody needs to see this again and this was almost one year ago. It was on February 15, 2012 from our very own recorder in San Francisco, California talking about the audit that he had done. You got to listen to it because this is the key to the whole battlefront. Well, good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming to be with us today. Uh, I'm San Francisco Assessor Recorder Phil Ting, and we are here to announce, in conjunction with Equitas, the uh, first audit of foreclosure records in the state of California. Uh, what we started with was We've been obviously facing this foreclosure crisis for a number of years, and little by little we had taxpayers come in who were either refinancing or they were facing foreclosures, and they wanted our assistance looking at their documents in our county land records. And historically, the process we have in California is called what's called a non-judicial foreclosure process, which means you don't have to go to court if you don't want to. And what it was developed was quite a while ago, before securities, before mortgage-backed securities, before Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. So it's a fairly uh, antiquated system, which clearly has not kept up with the industry and all the changes in the industry. And I think what this report shows is that the system is completely broken. The system's come broken for us as county recorders. The system's broken for the mortgage industry. The system is broken for consumers. Because clearly we have plenty of laws on the books, but they clearly are not being followed. There you have it, folks. We have plenty of laws on the books, but clearly they are not being followed. And that is the problem. We've got entities, judges, not following the law, even in the courtrooms. This is, this is just completely outrageous and we must stop it. So today, I've invited people, uh, we, we're hearing updates from all over the country, uh, from Hawaii, Texas, North Carolina, Ohio. We're going to talk about consumer laws. Uh, I'm going to bring you a little video from the American Bankers Association. Uh, it's really fascinating what is going on, but you know, the winds are changing. So the first guest uh, on our show today is from Hawaii. Douglas, introduce yourself, please. Aloha, my name is Douglas Leopold. I live here in Kailua, Kona, Hawaii, and uh, thank you for having me on your show, CJ. Thank you, Douglas, and, and you have just, um, you've gone beyond my level of understanding of what you're doing, so I want you to, exp I'm giving you several minutes today, maybe 20 minutes or so, to explain to the people how you are fighting back. Go. Okay, um, I'll start with a little history on, on how I actually got into this. Um, what had happened is I had uh, gone through a divorce and I ended up in um, 
uh, in our investment property and to what had happened in the market collapse I wasn't able to pay my mortgage so one evening I'm sitting down at a local restaurant I'm having um, a plate of pasta and a, and a salad and a glass of coke and across the bar from me is a gentleman sitting there and um, we started chit-chatting and he said to me he says so Douglas what do you do for a living and I said real estate <laughs> and this gentleman's name was Paul and Paul said boy do I have a real estate story for you so Paul went on to tell me about his story how he had gone to the courts in Honolulu and he got his house back free and clear from the bank and from the court and of course I sat there I looked at it and I'm thinking to myself pal you are so full of crap <laughs> It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> Have another cocktail. So <laughs> exactly. I exchanged stories with Paul for a little bit, and I went on my merry way. And approximately two months later, I um, got a knock at the front door. It was a sheriff. And the sheriff had some documents for me. I looked at these documents, and they were from uh, a law firm over in Oahu named Clay Chapman. And I stood there stunned in disbelief and, and literally shaking in my shoes. And I'm going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can't believe this is happening. So then I'm thinking, what do I do now? And then it hit me. Remember that fellow that you met <laughs> two months ago at the restaurant? He gave you his card. What the heck was his name again? I spent the next two hours rummaging through my desk to find his card. I found his card. I called him up and I said, Hey, uh, Paul, do you remember me? I met you at the restaurant, and um, I would like to buy you breakfast or lunch, and can you please tell me your real estate story again? So I met with Paul the next day, and he went on to tell me about how he'd been listening to these um, tapes and everything from um, uh, Ted Turner and Fred and Nina, and I sat there with absolute fascination because this time I'm paying attention because why? It affected me. Exactly. So this was approximately a year and a half ago, and I received that letter from Clay Chapman, the attorneys on Oahu, and I sent them what was called at the time a negative averment. I'm sure most of the listeners are familiar with that. So Paul helped me walk through that first negative averment. Now that kept them at bay. They never responded. That kept them at bay for almost a year. And then I received, and at that time, um, Clay Chapman actually said they represented City Mortgage. Now, my original mortgage was through Just Mortgages, Inc. in California. So Just Mortgages, Inc. had sent it on to Fannie Mae, and Fannie Mae had sent it on to City Mortgage. So I respond with a negative environment. Everything is fine. A year later, it comes back, and now Clay Chapman is representing Nation Star. We send them off a negative environment. And in the negative environment with this one, because we've learned a lot in the last year. Right. Thanks to programs like yours and all the YouTube stuff and Internet uh, information. And so what we did is we packaged a negative environment. And in this negative environment, I included 64 questions that I asked to the court. And those questions were along the lines of, um, is the court going to charge my straw man account? Is the judge aware of the frauds that have gone on with the industry? Um there are 64 questions that we ask them to respond with, three um, under affidavit, and of course they won't respond because if they do respond, they admit the fraud. Right. That's why these people will not respond. So I sent um, Clay Chapman, Nation Star Mortgage, the judge, the state of Hawaii, sent them all a negative environment. Anybody involved in this gets a negative environment. And, and you sent that to, like, corporate headquarters or to all the people involved? Every, every, everybody. So I name everybody. When I send out a negative environment, I name everybody. As an example, the negative environment that I sent to Clay Chapman would say, Clay Chapman, Pulis, Nervell, the law firm. Then underneath that, I will put in John and Jane Doe Corporations, 1 to 100. John and Jane Employees. One to a hundred. Right. John and Jane Doe quasi government corporations, one to a hundred. <laughs> so I'm trying to cover everything off. Exactly. So I sent them the negative environment, and the environment um, is basically templated off of the stuff that Turner was doing. 
Got it. And so we send that out. They've got 21 days to respond. They never responded. Uh, then we send the first notice off, first notice of demand, then a second notice of demand, and then the um, you know, notice of default. And then we send them the Nihil to sit, which is a notification of final determination and judgment. The last thing that we get is the notary affidavit of non-response. And everything is sent via certified mail, the little green cards. Yes. Because we need all that when we go to send in the Nihil to sit because it says on this date your office was sent this certified mail number. It was received by your office. You've got a track record of everything that you need to do to perfect the lien. Right. Okay. So they receive all that. Now, this is where it gets interesting because most people go, yes, I've got a judgment against them and you guys stop. Right. It is mentally rewarding, but it's not going to get you anywhere. Right. So then the next step was I actually set up an account at the Hawaii Bureau of Conveyances. So now I take these liens, record them at the Bureau of Conveyances. Let me tell you folks how powerful these liens are. I got a phone call last week from an escrow company and they represented one of the attorneys who's trying to refinance his house. She gave me a call and she said, hello, Mr. Leopold. Um, uh, it appears that you have a, a lien on uh, this gentleman, and uh, we're wondering if you would uh, like to take it off. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> I goodness. I laughed because I've leaned him. I've leaned his property. I've leaned his cars. I've leaned everything that he has. He's trying to refinance his house, and he can't. The UCC1, in my opinion, levels the playing field. You don't need an attorney to do it. You just need to know how to fill out the documents. It is the great equalizer in this country because anyone can file one. Uh, uh, okay, you've you've gone beyond what I understand and and can um, follow along. I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I know everybody that's listening can understand that too. But we would like to have you on next week. Could you help us do this with some of these documents and and go through it? Take the hour and show us these steps. Would you be willing to do that? Yes, I can. Oh, that would be fabulous. Uh, because um, now here's the point: the negative averment that you talk about did that did that stop the foreclosure action? Because I'm assuming that you got a foreclosure action on the property. That's what started this. Correct, and I'll get to that in just okay. a second. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So then from the negative environment, these things are very powerful. Remember, this is an international claim. So when they try to remove this, they cannot remove this in the lower courts because this is an Article Three claim. This is a federal administrative action. It's an international action. And it's the same type of action against them that the IRS would use to take your house. It can only be removed by myself or a jury trial. A judge may not remove that lien. So guys, don't be afraid, okay? You've perfected the lien, you have your signatures, as long as all your paperwork is in order, um, you should have no problem. And you use that paperwork to file at the Bureau of Conveyances. Now you don't file the whole document, you only file the first couple of pages because you don't want it made public what your business is. I've received letters from the Bureau of Conveyances that said, um, Mr. Leopold, will you please include the security documents showing the other party's signatures on them? And I write the Bureau of Conveyances back a letter that says, Aloha, I am receipt of your letter data, blah, blah, blah. Please understand this is a private matter and that the people have defaulted under a form of commercial claim, blah, 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 blah. It, so right. um, they're just trying to cover their butts. Right, right. So once they receive these recordings, they have to record it. <laughs> that sounds so familiar, doesn't it? Once the recorders get a notice of default, they have to record it. <laughs> Correct. Oh now, my goodness. Um, they, here's what, there's actually a conspiracy going on across the states to stop these recordings 
And what I'm about to tell you is very, very important, okay? Yes. The people at the state level have put out their own handbook for red flagging these types of actions. In my opinion, it is illegal what they are doing because they don't have the judicial authority. Uh, and since when did that ever stop anybody? Correct. I, I mean, that so is what the they problem. Try to do, they try to get you on little typos. They try to get you on, you know, supplying these um, uh, veerments with signatures and that, which you don't have to do because on the front page of your veerment, it's going to say this is a private and confidential matter. It's not for public use, blah, blah, blah. That's why you only file the first two pages of the veerment on their site. Right. So there's actually a handbook out that red flags a lot of things. And some of the things that you people need to be aware of is this. One of the big things they go after is these huge judgment amounts. If you have a judgment amount for $100 million and you're trying to record it at the Bureau of Conveyances, they're probably going to make your life a little more interesting. Right. You have to jump through a lot more hoops. Right. The other thing is that they're looking for the use of things like the straw man, the upper and lower case letters. You don't need to do that on a UCC-1 when you're filing against somebody. Right. Okay, so you guys, I would not recommend doing that at the uh, county level because they're looking for you. The um, recorders um, actually put out a handbook on how to spot what they interpret as fraudulent UCC-1 claims. Another handbook recently put out was the FBI handbook into sovereignty. And the funny part about that is they are like, Okay, we're looking for upper and lowercase spelling of the names. We're looking for all capital letters of the names. These people may be sovereigns. And then you think about it, well, their government-issued ID is in all capital letters. Right. All their own names in lowercase level letters. Right. So I guess they must be terrorists also. Right. No, it's, exactly. it's laughable. Right. Okay, so now we go through the UCC-1 process, and we have the lien. Now, it's my understanding that when things get recorded at the Bureau of Conveyances, that they are then picked up by the credit bureaus. So unbeknownst to these people, they have a lien against them, the credit bureau, because it's public record. Right. So now you start to hit them in their credit categories, just like they hit you. Exactly. Okay, so, you know, this, this is a wonderful, wonderful system when we know how to use it and we're going to beat them at their own game. Right. So now right. their credit starts getting dinged every single month. They fail to respond under affidavit to your claim. Right. And failing to respond under affidavit stands as fact of law. It's pretty simple. Right. They will steamroll you. Right. They won't care. This is how you get them to care. Just like the attorney who's trying to refinance his house over on Oahu. He can't. I have the lien. I'm not going to release it. Right. Okay. Right. And then from there... I'm hoping to get a letter. Well, I know I'm going to get a letter. One is going to try to get me into court, or the other letter they're going to send, I expect any day, will actually for a settlement. Right. That's the whole idea here, guys, is to get them to come to the table, make their life miserable. Yes, the people have no leverage. I mean, that's basically, we go to court with valid uh, objections, illegalities, for example, on the recorded documents in the foreclosure. doesn't matter. Judge just boots you out of court. And and so how do we get any leverage? This is one way. This is a leverage. Now, to digress for a moment, when I was in court, I went through the whole um, template that I have to keep them in a closed-loop circuit. At one point, I asked the judge where he got his judicial authority from, and he's just he says, I have it. <laughs> now, I'm sorry. That just sounds to me like um, the parent. You know, the kid says, hey, why? Because I'm the parent. <laughs> exactly. I have then it. at one point in the proceedings, too, um, the uh, judge denies ever receiving my certified mail. And he asked the attorney who appeared by telephone, he says, uh, Mr. O'Hara, did you receive any response from Mr. Leopold? And Mr. O'Hara, the attorney says, um, I don't think so. They were each noticed four times by a red certified mail. The complete 171 pages that I submitted to the court are on record, and they still denied on record in the court ever receiving them. That's how they steamrolled me. Right. 
Right. Committed and, fraud. And I've got it. I've got it on the DVD. I have the paperwork proving everything that I'm saying. And they still ran me over. So then I thought, okay, fine. We're going to do the UCC ones. We're going to record them at the Bureau of Conveyances. And then one day it hit me when I was doing some internet research. I thought, how can I collect on my lien? Right. Right. And here's how we're going to do it, folks. Now, have they... Have, then I'll be okay. <laughs> have... Okay. I'm taking the people involved because they have not paid me. I'm taking the corporation to involuntary bankruptcy. <laughs> this is Nation Star, right? Yes. <laughs> you Morgan, go for it. The attorneys will be going into involuntary bankruptcy. Now, I tried to do this originally a couple of weeks ago, and I filled out the Fed forms, and I tried to do it under Popper. And the pauper status basically means you can't afford the application fees, you know, you're looking for leniency, blah, blah, blah. Because they want $300 per. Right. So they sent me a bill for 1600 and something dollars and rejected the initial filing with a four-page rejection letter that said, well, this is very unusual. We've never actually had a creditor <laughs> ask for the pauper. I'm like, well, you guys put me in this position. Exactly. So exactly. I'm not going to argue it. I'm just going to pay it. I think it's 306 bucks. Right. It should stall everything because the bankruptcy should stall everything. And remember, this is this is a, a major corporation that I'm going to put into bankruptcy. Oh, exactly. Well, and you know, Nation, I call Nation Star an offshore dragon because they are a subservicer of mega banks, just like Aquin's a subservicer. Um, uh, there's a there's some other others that their names escape me right now but the fact of the matter is they've moved all their operations offshore they've purchased all the cert quote servicing rights except they are wholly owned subsidiaries of the mega banks and the mega banks are still master servicers they're just trying to hide that from people and because you can file against the mega bank like with the OCC but you can't file against Aquan for example or Nation Star because quote they're not regulated by the OCC so tell me now, in the foreclosure process on the properties, did that stall that? It, it, well, the bankruptcy should. Right. Okay, so the bankruptcy should stall it because it's a federal action. Right, right. The and the bankruptcy typically should do that. But any more grief that I'm having. And the whole idea, guys, again, is to get the settlement. Now, CJ, what you touched on earlier about these guys being all connected. Yes. And I had done my research on Nation Star. Nation Star actually has three corporations. They all operate out of 350 Highlands Drive, Texas. Huh. So you have like Nation Star Mortgage, Nation right. Star LLC, Nation Star Regular Holdings. But it was very right. interesting when I went online and I even did an SEC, Securities and Exchange, search. Right. I pulled up their 8K and their 10K forms, which is the filings for the type of business that they conduct. And it said that right in their forms to the SEC, it says, we do not buy mortgages. We are strictly a servicer. Yet, I have a letter from Nation Star Mortgage that says we are the owner of your mortgage. Oh, exactly. And, and they, exactly. I am not surprised at all. They, they lie, lie, lie. That's what people need to understand. Hey, and then I have another from yeah. letter from them saying we are the servicer. Yes. I have another letter from them saying, hey, we're actually, um, Fannie Mae owns your mortgage and we're the servicer. So I have three different stories from them. Right. And so doing my research on the net, I found out that these three companies are owned by a fourth company, Nation Star. And their address is on Uganda Drive in the Cayman Islands. Exactly. Yes, they've moved the headquarters it's interesting offshore. also Absolutely. Is that Fannie Mae put a UCC1 on Nation Star. Really? So the process that we're doing is the exact same process that Fannie Mae did to Nation Star, they lean them. If any of their debts go bad, Fannie Mae gets to come in and grab all the all the servicing mortgage contracts. I found this online through um, a search of the UCC. The whole thing is such a shell game. They play all the corporation shells. We've had other auditors, uh, title experts, explain how the one shell does this for another shell. You know, they they just. They literally are playing the shell game against the owners and the investors. 
and the government. They'll just play it against everybody for their own benefits. Correct. Wow. Once we do the UCC one and we get up into the the federal court level, I think that's going to be a bit of a game changer. Right. Now, there's also something else um, that says under United States Code, so if you have filed a negative environment against the attorneys and if you have liens against them, these people need to provide you with the insurance. Right. That you make a claim. And they won't. So under the United States Code, and I've been trying to find the paragraph, and if anybody has the paragraph, please email it to CJ so she can get it to me. Yes. It says that in 60 days of an action, that they must report their insurance company that they're being sued. And if they do not report it within 60 days, an officer of the court, right, it is a felony charge. Yes. And see, this is what I'm doing, Doug. We're going to have to call this short, but I'm telling you, I am working overtime this weekend because people like yourself and several people now are bringing in the law. Here's the point. What Doug is saying to us is that this law works really well and we can use it if we just know how. Right. And, and that is the point. I just so appreciate you for you bringing this to our attention. And the fact is this, it is a felony. Everything these banksters are doing are felonies. We just have to somehow figure out how to make the shoe go on the other foot. They've been stealing our homes with impunity, and I say theft because it is an outright theft. It's not their money. They've never been. They've already been paid repeatedly, even though it was never their money. They've cheated the investors, and now they're cheating the owners by stealing the houses. We so thank you in this battle, and we look forward to next week. I'll be dealing with you uh, soon about that. Thanks, Douglas. Here, my dear. Thank you for having me on the show oh, today. Thank you for sharing, and we just look forward to, to, to having more more details. And I know that our viewers, somebody has, is listening, and they will send us that USC code. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Bye-bye. Hi, this is CJ. You're on the air. Hi, this is CJ. Stu? Is, it, is this Stu? This is Stuart Nelson in Texas. Great, thanks. You're on the air. Be sure you uh, speak cl uh, closely into the phone. Okay, great. Perfect, that's better. So, br tell us what's happening in Texas. Well, what's going on here? I'm an activist, uh, researcher, been uh, aware for, many, for a couple of decades now, some of the uh, serious, more deep, root of the problem issues uh, going on in the country. Um, Right now, uh, well, in the last two years, I've been aware of uh, the American dream has been hijacked. Yes. Uh, you know, owning a home and raising your kids and having a nice little neighborhood, everything's been stolen. So um, I was a remodeling contractor for years, and I started uh, realizing that uh, uh, people, are, people are hurting out there and they're getting out of their houses, and I started investigating how could this be? I understand part of the problem, but uh, I needed to look a little deeper. So that's that's where I started becoming uh, much more activist oriented and uh, started stepping into the issues of looking into the mortgage debacle that's uh, going on now. Um, back in October, I was part of a Williamson County Land Records Audit we did in October. Um, and uh, on January 29th, um, from 9 to 12 a.m., there's going to be a whole crowd of us there at the county courthouse before the county commissioners. Williamson County is the county just north of Austin, Texas. Okay. And uh, we did a land records audit. We examined uh, 1,576 land property records for four days. And we found really serious issues of MERS and robo-signers and improper notary and all kinds of other stuff. 1,000, well, 1,500 of those, we found serious problems. I mean, that's like almost all of them. Yeah, almost all of them. Uh, now, a whole bunch of those, of course, those people have already been foreclosed on. Right. And... Uh, so what we're going to do is January 29th, Dave Krieger, the attorneys involved that are writing the opinion letter. I'm not an attorney. 
I don't give legal advice, but I I can refer to those that are attorneys and can give legal advice. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so we'll be at the county courthouse before the county commissioners and going over the report. Um, and uh, what uh, and then we're going to uh, videotape the findings and then put it on YouTube, and that should go viral within a matter of uh, a day or two. And I've already told you, and I want to share with our uh, viewers, that once that's on YouTube, I'm going to live stream it. So that it'll go out to our live stream, and it'll be archived in our records, so that anyone can watch it any time. So, so basically, you've gone, you went through just, just around 1,500 records. And are these, were these all foreclosures that you looked at? No, it was uh, it was uh, all it was, it was everything. A lot okay. of the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the local pullet. What what we pulled was the county land records. Uh, woman is Nancy Rister, and she ordered this thing and had it. And uh, I believe Dave Krieger had the who wrote the book Clouded Titles um, had to go before the county commissioner, and they had to you know present you know this and looking at all this. Well, Nancy Rister's elected. Okay. She pulled all. She pulled all the records of the of the city council, the mayors, the sheriffs, the the judges, all the um, political figures uh, in power, so to speak, in uh, Williamson County. She pulled their records. Those are the records we went through. <laughs> so let's go through the records of the local people that are in in charge. Uh, well, <laughs> the elected oh. uh, 1500 out of 1576, we found serious errors, and a lot of those were oh my goodness. Uh, some, of, some of the politicians there have files two inches thick of foreclosures they picked up and resold or whatever. Now, how they get those, uh, you know, I, I guess we can we can kind of figure out how they get those insider deals, but uh, I wasn't there, so I don't know. Um. <laughs> really? Really? Now that's going to come out in this uh, January 29th, right? I mean, are you going to discuss that too? Is that part of this um, audit? Well, I haven't heard uh, specifically what exactly is going to, uh, the, the attorney involved is uh, uh, writing the opinion letter, and I'm sure all that is going to be, uh, yeah, that's all going to, I'm sure that's all going to come out on YouTube. Whether now, when, when they step before the county commissioners, there's four men, four people on the county commissioner's court. Two of them have MERS in their, in their mortgages. Well, it's not surprising. I think MERS was 72 million mortgages nationwide, and they foreclosed a lot. But the, one of the last numbers I heard last year was like 40 million are still active. So it's not surprising. And, and I want to say, too, other attorneys have told me if it's not, quote, MERS, it's a MERS lookalike software database that does the same kind of fiasco, if you will, stripping the payment stream out of the note and securitizing it. So MERS or lookalike MERS, it's probably all of them. So, it's so, almost every single one of them. Exactly. So, so tell me, I know that we've chatted real briefly. I wanted to point out that Texas, there's three other counties in Texas that have a uh, lawsuit uh, that they just filed last December. Very well written. It's now linked on my um, uh, legal action by state homepage. And you mentioned to me that other uh, counties might be interested. This is Dallas, Harris, and Brazoria County, and they're filing against MERS Corp and B of A. So what do you have to say about that? Uh, I, I think it's very exciting. Um, Dallas County, I mean, it's Dallas, Texas. Harris County is Houston. <laughs> okay, so these are really, really big counties. Yeah, these are millions of people. So they've got hundreds of millions of dollars in unpaid. Now, mainly what they want, they want their recording fees. They realize they've been ripped off. That's the way I understand it. So, but, you know, how county, they want their money. <laughs> so. Right. I mean, now, the fact is, they actually, uh, when people look at this lawsuit, it's, it's linked now under Texas, it is actually extremely well written regarding the um, 
intertwinement of MERS and B of A and how they are all linked and sublinked. And um, in fact, I've got the some of the highlights of it on the screen right now, that B of A is a shareholder in MERS Corp and the plaintiffs move the court to pierce the MERS Corp and MERS corporate veils and impose liability upon B of A for the actionable conduct of MERS Corp and MERS alleged herein. This is, this is really, really fabulous. So now we've got big counties in Texas going after them. And, and hopefully as these lawsuits start to take hold, like Sue's already mentioned, other counties uh, can follow suit. Why can't, why can't, why can't all the counties in the country just like clone, just copy these, these, plain, these lawsuits, insert their own names and their own um, as, as plaintiffs? Uh, I, I would think that that would be a really good thing for counties to do. I, is there any, any likelihood that your county might do that? Um, well, I'm in Dallas County right now. Uh, Travis County is Austin, and uh, the, the records keeper there is a lady named De Dana De Dubois, and she has been uh, contacting and putting out feelers. She knows what's going on. And, right. Uh, uh, isn't it exciting how much of these counties are really catching on to this? Now, we'll see how they respond to all these illegal foreclosures. Well, that's the other, that's the next question that's going to come up. Okay, because I've been saying for several years now, you got to stop foreclosures. But that's just step one. If you stop the foreclosures so they're not allowed to file forgery and fake documents on the properties to steal them anymore, that's, that relieves the homeowner. But now you've got this huge mess in the recorder's offices, all of these forged documents sitting there, all these past foreclosures that are now known to be illegal it's like we can't even get the um the the judges to understand that that's what's going on but that is what's going on and like yesterday with um kevin harvey from o'brien's office the registrar of deeds in massachusetts they are filing for restitution against uh the pleading guilty one of the foreclosure mill firms lps doc x they're pled guilty to forgery and now it's restitution time and they're going after the assets of this entity and these people but obviously there's not going to be near enough assets to pay the restitution that's going to come in as claims so they're going to try to do exactly what these other counties are doing and that is piercing that corporate veil and making the banks who own these wholly owned subsidiaries and do business with them and are supposed to be overseeing them get them on the hook to pay. That's... To arrest them and throw their families on the street, let them know what it's like. Well, you know, I just, this is why I asked Doug to join us today. Because Douglas, over in Hawaii, he's figured out how to file the UCC1 liens on these people's properties, on their homes and cars. And so it immediately occurred to me, hey, if we need, if we need a, a supply of homes to give back to the people that lost their homes, how about those? Let's take the homes from the people that have perpetrated this fraud on the country and give them to the people that got cheated. Now that seems like really fair restitution to me. Yeah. Uh, maybe that sounds like Texas justice. <laughs> In Texas, we get a rope. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll just take the house, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing, Stu, and I'm gonna, it's on the calendar, I'm gonna keep reminding people that January 29th, 9 to 12, that's Texas time, in, uh, say it again, where is this gonna be? Uh, Williamson County, Georgetown, Texas. Okay, so the anybody- county square there, it's at, the, at the, the downtown county square. Anybody that can, that can drive there, that can support this effort, please support it. The more we get out in public media and the attention of the news and, and all the other people that have bought into the myth, they've bought into several myths. One is the homeowners are deadbeats. They, they didn't pay, so they deserve it. They do not understand what is really going on and we've got to fight back that, uh, that deadbeat myth. If they really understood that what is going on is a huge cheat game 
that the banks created, they did it intentionally, and now every bit of paperwork is not just a snafu of processing irregularity, it's actually forged documents where they've forged the authority, they've forged the signatures, they've forged the lenders, they've forged who owns the note, they've forged everything on these documents, and they use it in our courts to take our properties. And they've, they've gotten the judges on their side, and they've gotten the government on their side. If the people really understood how much is at stake, then all the people not facing foreclosure might start to rise up and support us. Thanks for bringing us an update, and we're going to want an update from you after this action. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Stu. Hi, Mary. Is this you? Yep, here. Okay, this is Mariella from North Carolina. Bring us up to date. What's going on in your efforts to stop fraud closures? Well, we're still fighting hard. We're having some victories. I think, like I said before, with the OCC complaints, the QWRs, we are slowing down the process, which buys us time to do more research. And we're going to take the position now to do more discovery at this point in addition to the QWR and other things that we're getting because the, the information we're getting back from the QWRs leads to other questions. So we're going to go after those questions and get those answered before hearing. We also are going to um, submit a document of information to our newly elected senator who has committed to doing some research into this and hopefully changing some legislation in North Carolina to um, a lot less easy for these banks to do what they're doing. So that's, that's going to be a big push. We hope to meet with our group this weekend and start putting that document together, including all the case law that's out there, because there's a ton of it in our favor. And we've got to deal with that and make sure that they all know that they've been on our side. And, and CJ, as we were talking earlier, we were talking about these judges who want to let these cases um, go through because they're afraid of what they're going to lose in their pension funds and that sort of thing. But the point is, the banks their pension funds are losing. You know, they, they, they don't understand that these investors are going back and suing the banks because of everything that's happened. These loans are no more no longer in these pools. They're lo losing their, their favorable tax status, whether they're being charged with it or not from the IRS, I don't know, probably not. But there's a lot that needs to come out so that these judges will understand that the system's not going to fall apart because we foreclose or we stop the foreclose. The only people winning this fight is the banks. Right. Hey, Mary Ellen, can you speak into the mouthpiece just a little bit and slow down just a little bit? We'd appreciate it. Uh, I can hear you, but I'm afraid it may not be coming out very well on the show. I was speaking into it. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, is that better? <laughs> and just a little slower. <laughs> I know you're getting wound up. We all get wound up. I don't um, get excited. Well, but anyway, we I know. are doing all we can here. We had a small victory with our clerk of court this week also. So, uh, explain what that might be. Okay. She has would not let us have access to the foreclosure hearing so that we could sit in on them. Okay, now, now, isn't that illegal? Yes. Okay, it is. so the and, and we got her on it. The um, the because I called our administration of courts office here in North Carolina and and said, you know, you guys need to help us out because under the public public access law, she's required to give us the calendars. So, so why has she been stonewalling? That's a good question, CJ. Don't know. But, so, but you got to remember, who makes money in these foreclosure processes? The clerks, the courts make money, the sheriffs make money. So it may be a part, a part of revenue. No. Or, or to curry favor with the judge? Could be, could be. Or to, to put a stop and, and make sure people know that they can challenge these foreclosures. She doesn't want them to be challenged. She wants to rubber stamp them and go on to the next one. So, so it, it, at the at the least, um, it's just she's lazy. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it, it's easier for me to just blow off the people and and just not even bother with that part of my job. I agree. Versus actually you know, supporting. She, she's been in that job for so long. Um, it's time for her to retire, and she's one of these people who says, "I'm in charge. I don't care what anybody says. I'm making my own laws," and that's basically what she did on all <laughs> of these calendars. She. <laughs> She says she's making her own laws. Right. <laughs> okay, guys, this is the problem. These people have become so complacent because owners, the, the public, 
we know so little we are we have been sitting on our butts we don't we haven't really figured out that we need to be advocates for our own freedom and rights and boy is this hitting us in the face and I'm telling you uh, this is happening everywhere I just spoke with somebody yesterday who is in Southern California and the county recorder that position is coming up for election and as we were talking she said she's an activist and fighting for closure she says you know I'm going to run for county recorder because if I'm a county recorder, trust me, none of these foreclosures are going to happen in my county. And, and really, I thought, that's what we need to do. We've got two that's what we need to, to do. run against her in this next election. Yes, that's what we need to do. We need to get and, power and to the people. At some point in time, you and I are going to be targets, okay? They're going to come after us. Nah. Informing <laughs> people. So when the attorney from the AOC called me back yesterday to let me know this, this wonderful decision, she asked me who I was and what I was doing while I was involved, and I said, well, I'm in here trying, I'm a retired realtor, I, I know, understand the chain of title, I understand what's going on here, and I'm helping these people put their documents together to contest their foreclosures. She says, well, are you familiar with the statute about practicing law without a license? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, yes, ma'am, I do. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. read it. I know what it says, and that's not what I'm doing. As if explaining and answers and showing forgery and fraud is somehow practicing law. Absolutely. They're going to call it whatever they can call it, but I'm telling you this. Uh, I just read something last night, and I've been saying this week, and having people on the show, and we're getting, we're collecting, like just yes, uh, just earlier on this show, with Douglas talking about the USC code, I've already had people say, what does he want? Oh, here's the code. <laughs> they're they're uh, I, instant messaging me. This is the point. Uh, this weekend, I've set aside I'm going to take all these codes, all these laws that we have, like filting. That's why I started today. We have the laws we need. We just don't use them. And so the people need to know what they are. And I'm going to make a list of what they are and what they affect. And here's one I found last night by, mm. by someone else. Get this. The, the whole idea that we're trying to come up with is to a, a simplified um, complaint or affidavit that can be taken by an owner on their documents or for their documents to the recorder's office showing the fraud and the forgery and and alerting the office to that uh, thing that's on their property and then the, here's here's the point in the penal code it actually states, and every county, every state has this. It may not be the exact same number, but it's all in everyone, every state's penal code. That once an official is notified and alerted to this kind of fraud, that these documents are being are forged and are being used to take the houses, that if they move forward, whether it's the judge, the sheriff, the recorder, anybody that moves forward in conjunction with this forgery and fraud is a conspirator in it absolutely they and are. is subject and, and to that's felony thing i'm going to do here because the the foreclosure mills the attorneys are complicit in that fraud absolutely certainly not they're not partial i mean they're they're very impartial I mean, they're very partial in what they're doing and we're going to expose them a absolutely and and just like um douglas was saying you uh, the people have no leverage, so this is how we get leverage. Yeah. Obviously, he's saying the UCC one filings, and we're saying we can do affidavits from expert witnesses and auditors if that's what it requires, and go into the the offices. We can go to the police, the sheriff, the recorder, the judge. Why can't we put these people on notice that this is what it is, and if they continue? we're going to charge them too. Well, what, what North Carolina has done as of October 1st, you cannot file a UCC lien or any kind of lien against a public official's real estate. North Carolina has already attacked that. South Carolina came out first. Um, so we won't be able to do that in North Carolina. And I know it has been done. It's a very serious thing to do, um, and it will bring all kinds of matter, you know, what down on you. But it is... Well, so that's something you have to be careful about when, when right. you go there. As right. a matter of fact, Tim Turner is in jail. Uh, he's in there for tax um, charges because he was not paying his taxes, but those, that was just one of the things they used against him to get him. To get him, right. After him quite a while. Right. I know him personally, so. 
and and see we're not really I'm I personally and I, I think that some of this stuff is probably too complicated for a lot of people to yeah. actually do that's why I keep looking for the 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 lowest the easiest lowest common denominator what's the simplest thing that we can uh, build the the simplest complaint that is universal enough that people can understand it they can use it and it will get us the results we need because really what we and, and Douglas I don't think is filing these against officials he's filing them against corporations and the attorneys that work for the corporations and and the employees and that kind of thing um, right. you know um, and, and that may be, I don't know, but I know right. that when people started doing the negative affirmance, it was against the individuals, because when you think about that, that individual judge who's sitting on the bench, he has a bond. He has to be bonded. Right. And so what a lot of people were doing were going after those bonds and seizing those bonds so they couldn't function. I think in right. some cases, some courts were, shut, were actually shut down for a period of time because those liens were there. Because without those bonds, they can't function. And, 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 I'm, all, and I'm all for shutting these guys down. Right. Right. When they will actually, because I've um, heard it, there's a, an attorney that had a perfect quiet title action in a California court. And the judge actually said to him in court, your, your lawsuit is perfect. Mm -hmm. And then he ruled for the bank against the homeowner because, again, it brought up what you've said before, that the judge actually said, if I ruled for the homeowner, the whole system would collapse. Right. Well, see, the judges have got to file, or any or any public employee whose pension is wrapped up in these mortgage-backed securities, right. they've got to get aggressive and start filing their own lawsuits. Right. Because they're losing out where, while the banks are making a ton of money for closing on those investments. Well, and here's the point. Um, one of my contacts has actually said they have um, they found evidence. And, and so I haven't been able to second source that. But they have evidence that the insurance payments, you know, the, the whole program sort of works um, when you default for 60 days, that's why they tell you to default. The insurance on the mortgage-backed security is triggered. And so the mortgage-backed security, that's the investment that's of the payment streams in these notes. They get paid. Well, the fact is, if that was tr if that was really happening, then why are our pension funds who invested in the those securities why are they hurting so bad? Well, the that the, interest payoff is going into the pockets of the bank. Absolutely, absolutely, they've been shunting those payoffs mm -hmm. out of the mortgage-backed securities into the bank's pockets. So that means CJ, who who is Bank of America suing, and who who sued? Was it Chase or or who was it? Chase and Wamu? Was it Chase and Wamu? They're, they're suing FDIC. You know, the banks are su suing the, the FDIC, the agencies, because they know they're not going to be able to get the flow of money that they would have gotten had had it done had all these assignments been, been done properly. Right. So they're the only ones making money. Oh, oh, of, of course. And everybody else is being cheated and losing. And we just, I, I think that that's a really good technique that you just said, Mary. Let's get these judges to understand it is not in their interests to vote for the banks, if you will, to judge rule for the banks. Right. And you said something last week that really hit home with me when you were talking about the control these banks have over everybody. Yes. That, that they're holding that, that hammer over everybody. Well, it's time to bring that hammer down. Right. And see, here's the, here's the actual fact of the matter. If, and I, just, I see this on me, mainstream media, I see this in, you know, I hear this from what the judges are saying, and they're saying, if we stopped foreclosures, mm -hmm. it, would, it would bring the banks down. That's it would ruin wrong. everything. And the actual opposite is completely true. Banks down, yes, it would. If we stopped foreclosures. Yeah, they've already made the money. We, yeah, we, we'd, it actually, stopping foreclosures would be the banks would not get paid two times on the loan. They'd only get paid eight other times. So, so what it would actually do is stop the threat of, of millions of people, the fear, and they're lying awake at night, and they're emailing me, and they're emailing everybody they can find on the planet. How do I stop this and keep my house? I just want a loan mod. And if they, if they knew that they, that bank could not take the house, then they could at least relax. And then all the activists, we could focus on fixing the loan, you know, the loan so that they could be modified. Right. So that we could get back to normal. But in the meantime, 
there would be no threat of loss people would feel like spending money more you know retailing would pick up uh, prices would continue because there would be no more foreclosures listed on the market period and we wouldn't even need short sales so we go back to a normal market and uh, it, contractors could build again it, we could reverse this nasty uh, list I always have up here now because people say oh my goodness it's so so true and that is you know, you, the home values fall, construction falls, jobs fall, the economy falls, you know, boom, boom, boom. It's just it's just a stack of bricks coming down. And if we can just keep getting the word out. And, exactly. And the girl that's doing the, um, the foreclosure story for us here that met with us back in a month ago, her story is supposed to come out next week in, in our local newspapers. So if Perfect. we can just get enough conversation going and wake up enough people exactly. to get what's going on, then, then we can put the pressure where we need it. And she has interviewed some people that I don't even know. She's interviewed one man who is, I think has cancer, is losing his home, oh. found him I don't know. But she's also picking up on these um, foreclosure fraud complaints we're filing with our sheriff's department. Oh, good. We're going to talk about those. So that is, you know. That's news. We've got some momentum. We just have to keep it going. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks, Mary, for bringing us up to date on North Carolina. And before we go, guys, I want to uh, bring you some update on reversals in court for in the homeowner favor in Ohio. And this is what's happening. And I hear this all over the country. People will talk to me. You can't. The homeowner is not getting justice in courts, but they get justice in the appeals court. So go to court. Expect to lose. Appeal you might get reversed, probably so. And I wanted to bring uh, some update. This uh, gentleman sent us two court uh, rulings. This is just late last year. This one is uh, just ruled December 31st, uh, 2012. And this is from the uh, um, Ohio Supreme Court. And One West Bank fa filed to foreclose. The original note could not be found a copy of the 2006 mortgage was atta attached. The person that the owners actually won because the court held that a party, meaning One West, that failed to establish an interest in the mortgage or the note at the time the foreclosure was filed had no standing to invoke the jurisdiction of the court. Moreover, a litigant cannot cure a lack of standing after they've started the foreclosure by later obtaining an interest in the subject of the litigation. In other words, those people got their house back. This is, when you follow the law, nobody should have lost their home to foreclosure. That is the truth. Here's another uh, Ohio Supreme Court ruling that a federal home loan commenced the foreclosure action before it attained an assignment of the promissory note, and so they have the lack of standing holds. The appeals court reversed it and gave it back to the homeowner. They have to have lack of standing. And I'd like to finish with this. Um, I want to talk real quickly. I'll have these links on the comment sections again. But this is uh, the new rules to protect distressed homeowners. There's a couple of articles here. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau intended to prevent abuses. And then you got to hear this. This is the American banker. The mortgage monitor gets an earful over loan mod modification lag. Uh, it's booting up. Sorry, it's supposed to be running. Let's see what's happening. <laughs> uh, here, let's try it again. Shoot, uh, it's an interesting video from the American Mortgage Banker. They're interviewing um, about the mortgage settlement with the big banks. Housing advocates say that there is a gap. This guy says, yeah, and you know, the poor banks, they have 300 rules they have to follow, and boo-hoo, we're saying, uh, it doesn't stop them. They're still dual tracking. They're still not doing the single point of contact. They're still taking the homes illegally. They're, it's still forged paperwork. 
And the fact is they don't have anything to say about that. They're saying, well, we just have to wait to see what the courts rule. So uh, apologize, that doesn't seem to be running. And but I just summarized it for you. And we'll have it next week if we can get it to, to work. So this is CJ Holmes, founder of Homeowners for Justice, signing off for our update Fridays. And I swear to you, we won't rest until we can develop a solution for everyone facing this fraud closure to keep their home and restitution for all of those that lost their homes illegally. Thanks. Till next week, this is CJ.